Welcome and thank you for joining tonight's COVID-19 Vaccine for Kids Med Talk, hosted by Dr. Daniel Cohen. We're going to go ahead and get started. Just a quick reminder, please keep your camera turned off and yourself muted. Um, you can also type questions into the chat box for a Q&A at the end. To access the chat box, you can hover your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom screen where you'll see a black bar pop up. Click on the chat icon and the chat box will open. Also, these PowerPoint slides will be emailed out tomorrow morning, so you will have them for your reference. Thank you, and I'll turn it over now to Dr. Cohen. Thanks, Sarah. This is uh, Dan Cohen. How is everybody doing this early evening? Um, I'm a for those of you who don't know me, I'm a pediatrician. Uh, I've been working for about 25 years in pediatrics, 15 of which uh, have been in Westchester, including at WestMed. Prior to that, I was um, an assistant professor at Columbia and worked in the department of the residency department teaching pediatrics and the like. But the, the most important thing I would say about today is that I'm not doing this just as a doctor, although I am a doctor and that's the reason why I'm having they're having me speak is because I've looked at all this literature, but I'm a parent. And I had initially named this COVID vaccines for our kids because I, the most important thing I can say to any of us when we're looking at this is that we will be making decisions for our children, which are always more difficult and fraught because we try to look at things from a much different viewpoint. So um, what's, that's the, the title slide. Let's go to the next slide. So the first slide is, would you vaccinate your child? And what we're gonna do in the, the hour or so is I'm gonna try to get through much, much of these slides pretty quickly. Um, there's a lot of facts, but facts tend not to hold very much weight against bias, but I wanna set the story. And these pages that I'm gonna be showing you are gonna be information that we can use to have the discussion later on. Um, so initially, we'll talk a little bit about the, the premise of the vaccine itself and some of the, the, in the information about it, some of the, the information that we all know about how significant this pandemic has been and the number of people who have been affected, especially children. And then we're going to go through some of the misconceptions uh, about the vaccine and about the disease itself and end with the idea, uh, end with a Q&A. So if you have any questions, as CR said, you can go to the chat room and send that down to the chat bar and I'll try to hit as many as I can at the end. So I apologize if I speak fast, but I really think the most important part of this entire talk will be the question and answer. So the question of vaccinating your child was actually broached by an article in Pediatrics, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics main journal. And they, interestingly, they, uh, study out of UCLA looked at a, they sent a questionnaire out nationwide to 1,745 people. And the percentage of people that would vaccinate their kids under the age of 12 or under the age of 16, they broke it all up and they found that less than half would vaccinate their children against COVID. And that was pretty disconcerting to everybody. Um, let's go to the next slide. But one of the things that they found in this study was that where would people prefer to get their information from? Where was the most trusted source in a world replete with information and misinformation? And the most trusted source happened to be the family doctor or pediatrician, thus me. So that's why, they're ha that's why the choice was to have me talk about this today. Um, so as I said, we're gonna discuss the vaccines, the misconceptions, and a little bit about why the situation is different for children than they are than for adults. They are not simply little adults to get the same uh, premise. Let's go to the next slide. So briefly, this is stuff you see every day on a scroll at the bottom of a screen that really has lost its meaning, it seems that. But COVID-19 during the, pa the pandemic is numbers of things we haven't seen for more than a century. As of August 20th, there have been 210 million cases worldwide and 4.4 million deaths. That number is just ceases to have meaning very much anymore because it's so insanely high. Um, but today we're gonna to be talking about children. And in the United States, as of August 19th, there's been 4.3 million cases and 
luckily, as we've learned throughout the time, children do not seem to get the severity of the disease that adults do. Um, but there have been 370 deaths as of August 19th. So it is not a completely benign situation either. And remember that much of this data was before the Delta variant really started to change the rules. Next slide, please. This slide just to sh goes to show you uh, a lot of people were, we were all lulled into a sense of security. As you can see, the big white arrow pointing to, to the, right, the, the right side of the screen. During the summer, things looked great. We were going to Bruce Springsteen concerts. People thought they were gonna have concerts in the park. People were getting together. Everybody was happy and ripping their masks off and then Delta. And Delta happens to be much more contagious than some of the other variants. We'll get into that more later. And as you can see, the slope of that line going up is the scariest part of it. We haven't reached where we were in the January and February months, but that slope is going up and it hasn't stopped going up. So uh, next slide. So the number of cases were going on in that in the initial period. So we're gonna talk about what everybody has said is the, the most promising thing that was gonna get us, we all were hoping we we're gonna get us out of this pandemic, which was the vaccine. And we're gonna focus mostly on Pfizer because I'm a pediatrician. And as of now, that's really our option for kids. So the phase one trials, which, uh, when you study a vaccine, they go through three sets of trials. The first one is basically, does it do what you want it to do? They use smaller numbers of people. They, mat, you know, they match up what the effect will be based on a dose and they, they trial and error and they see if it's going in the right direction. Generally, if a drug company is doing a trial, they do that. If it works, they then have to generate more money they have to get more people, and then they go to phase two trials. And in phase two trials, that's where they try to find the right dose to get a dose response part of the, this. And they usually have thousands of people in that. And then if that works, they have to generate more money, find more people, and then they go to phase three trials. And that's more of the, the safety and effect numbers where they get tens of, you know, high thousands or tens of thousands of people. And they did that with this, with the Pfizer vaccine. And we'll get into a little more why this is an issue. It kind of comes into the part of the story where people feel like this was rushed. And we'll get to explain why it didn't. As you can see, as of September 12th was Pfizer and the Pfizer vaccine, it had about 44,000 participants in their studies, which is a large study when it comes to vaccine beginnings. Uh, HPV, which was one of the last, the HPV vaccine that came out about 15 years ago or so, they had in the tens of thousands up to about 20,000 people. So this was markedly, you know, this is significantly more than that. Um, the studies, as we all heard famously, had about 90 to 95% efficacy, and the side effects were well, generally, you know, mild to moderate. And because of that, they were granted emergency use authorization. Again, we'll get into that in a little bit. First in Britain, they beat us to the punch because they were having the cases. And then we got it in the United States after that. In May, on May 10th, the FDA decided to expand their emergency use authorization for children down to age 12. Uh, next slide. The reason that happened was that they found when they studied in children down to age 12 and for, for the ages down to 12, they used the same dosing, same um, interval, and basically the same premises that they did for the adults. They found that children under age 12, they had eight, they had between 13 and 1800 in the, the placebo group who did not get the vaccine and about the same amount in the treatment group. In the treatment group, the people who got the vaccine down to age 12, nobody got COVID. In the placebo group, 18 kids got COVID. So it showed a great efficacy. Now granted this is one trial, but you take that add it to the fact that we had a lot of adult data going on showing similar efficacies and less issue, you know, the side effect profile was still very good for these mRNA vaccines. And that's why they were able to get emergency use authorization. So now the next step and why we're having this talk is, well, what are we gonna do as school is approaching for all our kids less than 12? And since about April um, of this past year, they Pfizer and Moderna have been bringing in kids from 12 down to five, and then another group from five to two, and another group from two to six, uh, six months. And 
going through these same kind of trials again. And they're getting data. Uh, last we heard the Pfizer was hoping to get all their data done by September and be able to go through the same process. But there were a couple kinks, you know, obviously there's a lot of pressure from both sides, people wanting the vaccine, people not wanting the vaccine, school approaching, all these things were pushing things forward. And then there was the discovery of some young men, both in Israel and the United States who had mRNA vaccines and had myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle shortly after the second dose. And even though the numbers were very small, they, they kind of set up a signal where we had to recognize that there could be something and they were investigating that. We'll get more into that investigation later. But as far as how that affected the younger kids getting the vaccine, the FDA basically said, you know what, before we just say it's okay with the numbers you have, let's add a few more. Let's make sure we get enough information before we just say, yes, we can bring this down to the younger kids. Um, Things are not stagnant at this point. Uh, Pfizer is also looking to see if they can combine that vaccine with other vaccines that children have for much more in the future. Once it gets FDA approved for even those younger kids, then one day, if the pandemic doesn't go the direction we want and this becomes something like the flu that's coming back, they'll have an ability to do that. Right now, that's still all being thought, but people are the premise of that is that they wanna make sure people know that they're thinking ahead. Uh, next slide. As I said, for the, the vaccine trial, they had about 1,300 for each side. That's the data that we were talking about, the 18 symptomatic, case, the symptomatic cases of people who had the placebo versus the ones who, the none who were vaccinated in the 12 to 15 year old age group. They did find the kids between 12 and 15 who got the, the adult dose, which is what was given to the, those kids, did tend to have a stronger immune response, which is a good and a bad thing. It's good because they'll have protection hopefully for longer and better protection. It's bad because the immune response is what gives you the side effects. So there was more fever, they found about 20% more fever in these younger kids. For the kids that are in the studies now under the age of 12, they have found based on the fact that those 12 to 15 year olds had such a good immune response that they didn't need the same dose. So they've cut the dose down and they found that even a third of the dose given in two doses is seems like it gives an adequate immune response for these younger kids, which will limit the amount of side effect, hopefully, and maintain the amount of protection that they will get. This kind of feeds into some people I know have been running to ask their pediatricians to do what's called off-label use and say, you know, my 10-year-old's, he's 11, he's going to be turning 12 in a month, you know, in a year. Can we please give him the vaccine early. And the reason they can't is one, there isn't any third dose vaccine that's out there. And two, no one's gonna take that chance until we have the data. And that's the really important thing. Pediatricians don't just say yes to vaccines. We say yes when we read through all the data. And that's the point that we're at right now is waiting to see what this information shows. The last part of this slide says about the myocarditis cases, as I said, were going up initially, they found it in military young men in Israel, that there was a, a higher number than people would like to see. And then in the US it's happened. We'll go to the next slide. And because of that, they're now looking to see more data. As I said, I'm gonna get into myocarditis as a topic on its own later on in the, the presentation. This slide just goes to show you that there's a bunch of different vaccines, but the reason why I wanted people to look at this is for that middle phase. The middle phase is the, the Pfizer vaccine. And this is trying to give you an idea of what an mRNA vaccine is. mRNA is a piece of genetic material, but it's not genetic like DNA, all right? So what mRNA is, is a page of an instruction manual that's used to make a protein period. It is not something that makes the whole virus. It doesn't change your DNA. It doesn't get involved. In fact, in the cell, you have the nucleus that is the set. That's basically the hub of the cell. And inside there is the genetic code. That's your DNA. mRNA doesn't enter there. mRNA stays on the outside and is read and produced protein. So as you can see on this slide, there's this thing that says spike. Um, it's very small, so if you don't see it, it's the part with blue in the middle part of that slide. 
The spike mRNA is the code of how to make the famous spike protein that's on the outside of the virus. Connected to that are a couple other, you see these P's and A's at the end, and what those are, are a self-destruct mechanism. They're a timer because mRNA doesn't stay very long. So when you put this in, this gives it a little bit of time to exist and then it goes away and doesn't exist anymore inside the body. It gives the body just enough time to make some copies of this spike protein so the body knows what to recognize, but it doesn't give you the virus. The outside of this, the yellow curve is just a fat molecule. It's called a nano, a lipo nanoparticle. And that's basically just a way to have it because mRNA, if you just put it into the into fluid, it goes away too fast. So this allows it to get into the cell. The cell reads it, makes some spike protein, and then your body goes, oh, wait, I recognize that. So briefly, before we go to the next slide, what is a virus? A virus really is a packet with an instruction manual on this inside, multiple pages, how to make the packet, how to make more instructions. And basically all it wants to do is make more copies of itself. That is its modus operandi. That is the reason it exists. And all it wants to do is make more copies. So the reason it causes problems is it uses us as the copy machine. So when it gets into a cell, it starts taking, you know, making more and more and more copies of itself. And as you can imagine, you get all this virus in there, and then the virus can destroy that cell. Now, it, this vir the co coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, has these little spike proteins at the edge of it. They're almost like Velcro that allow it to attach to the cell. So they decided, let's not make the whole book. We don't want to make a virus. Let's just rip one page out and let's go to the next slide. This is where I, we get into the discussion of this. So this is my, my gift is my metaphor. So all we're really doing with this, this vaccine, the idea of an mRNA vaccine is we have a whole book here and the book is a dangerous book of how to make a bomb. But all we're doing is taking one page out and saying, if you can recognize these ingredients, and in this case, this ingredient, one ingredient, you can stop this. And so the spike protein is like a red hat on a criminal. And if you said, here's how to make a red hat, if you see this red hat attack it, that's how the body works. The, as I said before, we only get two doses of this and the mRNA only exists for a couple hours or I'm not sure, probably like nine to 10 hours, but it's not extended periods of time. So to have a long-term effect, like from a medication or something, you need that medication in your system for a long time. This, all it does is it makes a couple pieces of spike protein, replicates it out, your body recognizes it, and then your immune system has learned the lesson and knows what to attack. Um, as I said, if there's any more questions about that, you can send them through the chat. I'll go, be happy to go back through that. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So... Now we're gonna go on to some of the misconceptions. And as I said, this we're gonna go through a lot of these probably in the Q&A, but there are some misconceptions that I really have to just read out loud. I can't analogize them, I can't simplify them, but these are some of the most common questions that come up when it comes to concerns about giving COVID vaccines, especially mRNA vaccines to our children. And probably the most common one I hear in my office is I've heard that it could affect the fertility of my developing daughter or son, and they're so young and I don't wanna do that. The British Medical Journal found that, and there's a study and I, I, I documented it here, there is absolutely no evidence, not that there were no studies. Sometimes when they say there's no evidence, you have to be careful. No evidence might mean nobody looked, but there were no evidence in any study that has looked that COVID vaccines can affect the fertility of women or men. They have been studies that looked at giving it to pregnant women, lactating women, checking sperm count in men. There, again, the second slide, guidance refutes any link between vaccines and fertility. There is absolutely no evidence and no theoretical reason that any of the vaccines can affect fertility of women or men. The purpose, what happened with this is what happens a lot in information on the internet. We live in a world now where people tend to think more like lawyers, not that there's anything wrong with that, than doctors. And what I mean by that is if you have a thought 
a lawyer finds a piece of evidence that enhances their thought as a way of proving their point. A doctor wants to look at the body of evidence and find the truth. Not that lawyers aren't looking for the truth, but they're trying to prove their truth. It's just a different way of doing this. So when you hear someone out there say that, that your daughter or son may have their fertility affected, people started looking for reasons why that may happen. And it didn't take much. Someone f says that their periods were in a different order, you know, or they had a regular period after they got the shot. Now, saying you got it after the shot doesn't mean the shot caused it. It just means it was after the shot, but maybe the shot did cause that. But because of that little anecdote, that one point, that can then be construed as maybe there are issues with fertility. In the history of vaccines, there has never been a vaccine that affected fertility. So this is a really hard one because parents are talking about a distant future event and you can't just blow that off. That's a fear. And so you have to understand the fear, but it's really hard to argue something that has no information, no negative information. There isn't anything there. So this is something we'll get into more when we talk about it later. It is safe to be given to pregnant women at this point. It has been studied, not such people are trying it. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology actually recommends women who are pregnant in the midst of the pandemic to get the vaccine. It is recommended to be given to lactated, lactating women, which means that they're around babies. This is a safe and effective vaccine and obvi it decreases the risk of getting your very young children who can't get the vaccine protected. Um, interestingly enough, I even looked to see how it affected uh, men's fertility because I've had some parents ask that. There was one study I found, and it's only one study, so you can't base it on that. But in that study, half the men who got the vaccine sperm counts went up afterwards. So, I mean, we could use that too and say it's going to take the place of Viagra, you know, but it doesn't mean that. But that's the problem. We live in a world who wants to grab a thought, use it, and if it fits with their own bias, they'll take it on. But there is no information, no, there is no evidence. There's plenty of information. There's no evidence that it affects fertility. Okay, next slide. So here are some of the fear questions that I deal with in the office and some of the facts that go with them. So as I said, we'll get back to the fact, were the vaccines rushed? This happened so quickly, people talked about it as a monumental event, a monumental event of science. This happened fast, but it wasn't rushed. The reason why it happened, if you remember when I was describing the phase three trials, usually phase three, phase three trials are done in succession, where you don't go to two until you finish one. You don't go to three until you finish two, and there's spaces in between where you have to recruit and make money and do all these things. These trials were layered. So they were being run nearly simultaneously with the, the hope that if it worked, you already had data for the second. If it worked, you had data for the third, but they did everything correctly. And in fact, they were already producing product at the risk that they may have to throw it all out. Billions of dollars of material because they had backing from the fact that the entire world was worried about this. So they had doses at the ready just in case their trials worked out and to the, to the credit of the scientists that did this, this worked out better than most vaccines or better they can ever hope. So the vaccines were not rushed. Um, the second one is the MRA changes genetic code. As I mentioned to you when we were talking about this, mRNA does not affect your genetic code. It can't get in, it doesn't touch it. Your genetics has nothing to do with this. This is one page. You have your own instruction manual, this is one page of a different instruction manual and it never gets in. So it's just a way of making a protein for your body to see. In fact, people are gonna be using this kind of research if you've heard about CRISPR and things to treat genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia, which has already been treated by giving something, changing some code and then you can produce a protein. Here's the, the most difficult of all the questions I would say. And we're gonna go into this again towards the end, but the idea of, well, what about long-term effects? The vaccines only existed, as you were saying, Dr. Cohen, since September it was okayed. How do we know there's not gonna be anything long-term? And unfortunately, predicting the future 
just like the weathermen know and everybody else is fraught. It's, it is not fair to basically say there is absolutely no way. So what do we do to predict things? We look at our past. And if you look at the history of vaccines, from the polio vaccine forward, in the history of vaccines, the only long-term events were discovered within eight weeks for all vaccines. And we'll go through some of those events late on some later slides. As I said, most long-term effects with medications or pharmacologic agents have to do with repeated use that build up in your system. This is in your system for hours to days and gone. And that's probably why vaccines very rarely have long-term effects. They can cause a systemic effect. You know, you can get an inflammatory response, but that's why everybody watches these things. And there are multiple redundant safety systems, including just public reporting, as a way of making sure we're not gonna miss something bad that can happen. And we've already seen that multiple times throughout this, throughout the vaccines rollout. Johnson & Johnson had the strokes, the, the, the thrombo, uh, thrombotic cerebral strokes that came up, but then those have kind of waned off. Uh, mRNA vaccines have had myocarditis. Um, there was some thrombocytopenia, which is low platelet counts that happened in the beginning, but the numbers are very low and it, it's a good signal and a good way of watching so we can make sure everything's safe. But importantly, when you look at long-term issues, it's not just time, it's experience. And the way I've described this to patients recently is there are billions of doses out there and they've been out there for months, billions of doses, not millions, billions, that's a lot of data. So if you're looking for able to predict a long-term problem, it's like saying if you had a car in your driveway for 17 years, was there gonna be a problem during those 17 years? Well, if you only drove it once, you don't have any data, even though it's been 17 years, you're not gonna be able to predict the problem. But if you drove that car, cause you were delivering pizzas and you drove that car 80 times a day for the first week, that's a lot of information. You start to get the sense that everything, the brakes work, everything works because it's not just about the length of time it's been, it's how much have you used it. And because these usually happen within weeks, because it's been watched and there's billions of doses, that's why you're hearing scientists and doctors and everything say, you really don't have to worry about this long-term problem. But the unknown is scary for some people and we'll get into that towards the end. The, are they tracking us? The microchip one, I have had parents tell me that they didn't think this was even a vaccine. Uh, okay. Um, my own daughter tried to put the magnet on her arm. You know, <laughs> I don't know what to say, except for the fact that you have Alexa in your house, Siri on your phone. Every time you give your email address to somebody, your Facebook, your car, Wi-Fi, credit cards, if you don't want people to know about yourself, you're going to have to move to someplace in the Canadian deep woods where there's no stuff. It's just what it is, but they're not tracking you with this. They, they're, as Dr. Offit, Paul Offit is a great vaccine, uh, infectious disease doctor who talks about that. He goes, the needle is too small to have anything go through there. So I that's there. And then finally, FDA approval, which as I see in the slide, I wrote, hopefully by this time, this will be done. It is done. So the FDA has approved down to age 16. The reason they haven't improved, approved between 12 and 15, data. They need more data to do this. So why is it okay to have emergency youth authorization and not FDA approval? And the example I came up with for this, because I've been struggling with this one, because how do you explain it? Because I understand why it's safe. And Dr. You'll have Dr. Fauci and all these scientists saying it's safe, it's safe. But then why didn't the FDA do it? Those of us who are parents who have a home, if you've ever applied for a mortgage, you go online, you hit a button, it says, you will be approved. You're going to get your mortgage. They, they've looked at your credit score. They look at the quick things. You know you're going to get your mortgage. How long does it then take you to get that mortgage? So the button pressing, saying you're approved, knowing you're going to get that mortgage, that's emergency youth authorization. That's the idea that they know there's enough information there, and this is an important thing. We can get going now. But the FDA has a higher standard. They have to check everything. 
They have to go through every paper, check the lines, check the factories where it's used, check the process that it goes out in, and they have to check all the boxes. Just like when you're doing a mortgage, you have to check all these boxes and sign, what, 7,500 pieces of paper? But you knew you were going to get your mortgage six months ago. That's the difference. That's the difference between the FDA and emergency youth authorization and why as doctors in the midst of this emergency, we just wanted to get you into your home, so to speak. We wanted to get you safe and get this process going while the FDA was checking the boxes and just doing the dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Okay, next slide. So we'll go back to that long-term question. So Dr. Offit again, and a lot of other vaccine doctors have said that until you have 100,000 doses out there, that you're still worried about safety. As I said, we don't have 100,000 doses. We have 1,000 million doses out there. There's billion doses out there. So we have the information. To look at what's happened in the past, when the polio vaccines were first rolled out, people would get very rare episodes of actual polio. They'd get paralytic or paralysis from the polio vaccine. And up into the 1970s, there were still cases of paralytic polio caused by polio vaccine found in the Western hemisphere, very rarely. But they happened to within one to four weeks of that vaccine being given. It wasn't eight years later that someone suddenly got paralyzed because they got polio vaccine. And because of that, they made changes. And now most of the kids in, in, the, in the United States, kids very rarely, if ever, get oral polio vaccine. They get inactivated because the risk is so low and we don't want to have any attributable risk to that. Another example is back in the 1970s, the flu shot was very different. And there was something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a horrible illness, which is an ascending paralysis that tends to happen with viral, that can happen rarely with viral infections. And this was happening with the flu shot when they came out in, the, in usually, I think it was 1976 when they started seeing a bunch of cases. Again, this happened within eight weeks. But the other thing that's important, and this is very similar, the reason I bring this up is very similar to the COVID situation. Even with a horrible thing like that, Guillain-Barre happened 17 times more to people who got the flu than got the flu vaccine. But then science looked at this and said, well, we don't want that vaccine. That's too much of an attributable risk. Let's change it. And the flu shot has been different ever since then and safer. And they're, lo they're always looking to change it. There's hope in a few years it'll be an mRNA flu vaccine that can be more, red more effective, more readily available, quicker to respond to changes in the flu uh, species that comes out that year. The last two vaccines on there aren't ones that had long-term effects. They're examples of things where people found signals of dangerous things that happened after the vaccine that then in the end were proven not to be anything. And that's why it's very careful. We have to be very cautious about jumping to conclusions, just seeing an adverse event. Menactra is the meningitis vaccine. And I find that of all my vaccines that we give to kids, it's the one parents argue the least about because they know meningitis kills people. Even though it's probably the rarest of the diseases we see, people die. When Menactra first came out, there were clusters of cases of this Guillain-Barre syndrome around Menactra doses. And it was in a couple areas of the United States. If I remember, I think it was Wisconsin and Michigan. There were a few cases. And actually when they were putting the vaccine out, they'd have little warnings about Guillain-Barre when it first came out. This was back about 18 to 20 years ago. Over time, they kept watching, kept tracking for it, and it went away, and we just don't see it anymore. And what was likely to have happened was at the same time people were getting this vaccine in that area of the world, there was some other virus causing Guillain-Barre, but they got Guillain-Barre after they got the shot. So getting it after they got the shot doesn't mean that it's caused by the shot, but it's correlated around the timing of the shot. And that can get very confusing, which is why it's important to keep looking for this information and why science and doctors and everybody keeps doing it. The other thing about misinformation is H the HPV vaccine, which many of you know we give to adolescents now. HPV is human papillomavirus, and it is the cause of 95% of cervical, 95, did some even say 98, but 95% of cervical cancer in women, which is a young woman's disease. And when this vaccine came out, 
there's a great video on the New York Times called, it's a very sad title, called Terminally Ill by 25. And it talks about this huge misinformation wave that came out about HPV vaccine affecting fertility, causing other problems, people dying after getting it. And if you look at the data, it's a lot of these stories were hypocritical. And if you go to places that do really good HPV vaccination, cervical cancer has basically been eradicated in young women. That's the importance of finding out the data versus just looking at the anecdote. Don't just read the title, look deep into the information. And we'll get more into how to do that later on because it isn't as easy as people think. The final thing I'll say with this long-term thing is when people hear about long-term problems, their first impulse is, you know what, I just want more time. I just wanna wait a little bit. And this is really important when it comes to COVID. When you're dealing with a pandemic, waiting is not benign. It is very, very important to know that every chance this virus gets to divide, you could get a new variant. And the next variant, maybe the vaccine won't work. Like the Lambda variant that's in Peru, the vaccines aren't effective against it. Or it could be more deadly and more contagious. Maybe the next one will be dangerous to your own kids. I hope not. You're seeing in the news that there's more children getting sick from the Delta variant, at least down south. We haven't really seen as much of that here, and that wasn't true in England. So I don't want to use that as a fear factor. But I will tell you that every place there's been a big outbreak in the world, we got a new variant. In fact, when we were in that happy place in the summer, that, that slide with the big arrow pointing to August, when we were in our happiest moment, I was sitting in my kitchen. My wife looked at me. She's like, what's wrong? And I said, do you see what's happening in India? I'm like this isn't done. This Delta variant is like running through everything. And in a matter of months, it's here because that's what viruses do. They cross lines. They don't care about oceans. They go where people go. And if we wait and don't lock all our doors by getting everybody vaccinated, we're going to get another variant. And then we have to do this all over again. Next slide, please. Myocarditis. So myocarditis came up, as I said, from Israel studies in a few young men in the United States who two weeks, a few days after the second vaccine, so not two weeks later, like three to four days usually after the second vaccine, had chest pain, difficulty breathing, uh, some had fever, some just had fatigue with chest pain, more so than they would think. Myocarditis, the word means inflammation of the heart muscle and can be very dangerous. It can lead to trouble with the function of the heart muscle, the rhythm of the heart muscle, and it can lead to scarring. Um, COVID itself can cause this. And there was also that uh, the MISC, which was the Kawasaki's like syndrome people heard about, can also cause myocarditis or, or inflammatory conditions of the heart like myocarditis. In fact, pediatricians are still dealing with this, especially this time of year when we're clearing people for, for sports who had COVID because Enough kids who had myocard uh, had COVID can have mild myocarditis from that. So when the vaccine started seeing this, people's eyes lift, lifted up. As of July 9th, there have been 304 confirmed cases of myocarditis in the ages of 30 down to uh, down to 12. Most of which in the higher ends of that, um, there were no deaths. More than 95% of them were self-limited diseases where they either got steroids or an anti-inflammatory like an ibuprofen-like product. And the people got better. There are very few severe cases. There are still some people in the hospital, very few. And there are still some people who they're not sure what exactly the cause was. Um, they're looking into this. To me, the most important thing about the myocarditis is so I know. Because if I have a child that I give a vaccine to, let's say my own 13 year old son who did get vaccinated and two days later, he starts complaining of chest pain. I'm not gonna tell him to suck it up and go run. I'm gonna bring him in. I'll do an EKG, we'll do blood work. We'll look to make sure he's safe. But of those people that had it, as I said, virtually all of them recovered and recovered fairly quickly. Next slide, please. Um, the newest information, I won't go into this too much, just briefly, a lot of the way they diagnosed it were things where some people were in the hospital, not because they were so sick, but because they had signs on a blood test or signs on what's called a cardiac MRI. 
they barely had any symptoms, but because of this new thing, they were brought in and observed. Um, and so we're still kind of learning about this. And I think it's very important that we know. Next slide, please. The best way I've described this to parents as far as the risk benefit of giving the vaccine versus waiting for COVID for young boys is that, again, Dr. Offit came up with this analogy that if you put 100,000 adolescents into a stadium and you vaccinate all of them, two of them get myocarditis and they go home. If you leave them unvaccinated out of 100,000, 1,300 get COVID. And even though they're adolescents, in that number, you still could have two or three, some say even up to six deaths if you include like the 30-year-old people, even though those aren't adolescents anymore. But you can still get death and you can get long COVID syndrome and MISC cases and severe illness. 1,300 to two. Next slide, please. The other thing to remember about all this information I'm giving you, this was all pre-Delta. And as we've seen, and as I brought up and I will bring up a time and time again, the Delta variant is more contagious. Whether it's deadlier or not, we don't know. It seems that way down south, but that's probably because of the number of cases more so than the number of people getting it. But the virus does replicate. It makes it more of copies of itself much more quickly. And to think about what this means for vaccinated and unvaccinated people, when you get, if someone gives me the virus this instant, I cannot spread the vaccine right now, but the virus starts to make more copies of itself. And sooner or later, you're gonna to get to a point where you now can spread the virus. That's the contagious point. And Delta gets there a lot faster. What happens is if it continues to replicate, you get to a point where you're now symptomatic, you now have disease. But if you're vaccinated, as the virus starts to make copies, your body's fighting it off trying to keep it away from that point and so you don't get contagious and you don't get disease. And what we found, it is you know, obvious in the hospitals because Delta divides so quickly, we have a lot of people hospitalized with Delta, but we are seeing some people who are getting past the contagious point with mild symptoms, even though they're vaccinated. And that's why the vaccine was never meant to be, was hoped to be perfect, but it won't be perfect. But it's very important if the more people are vaccinated, we have more defense. We keep this virus numbers down and the quicker we get rid of it, the less chance of more variants. Next slide. So what can we do while we'll wait? I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, our kids aren't gonna be vaccinated right away. I was hoping it would be somewhere around Thanksgiving. I still have fingers crossed, but with the myocarditis and the need for more data, this may push things even further back to the early next year for some kids. And for the kids under age five, that might not be for even till the spring, unless things start to change. So we wanna protect ourselves with a layered defense. Let's go to the next slide. The reason why kids aren't as, uh, as easy to spread it as adults are and why schools tend to be a safe place is I always call it the cloud phenomenon. Adults take bigger breaths, we blow out more, we move more particles, so we spread more virus. Kids take smaller breaths, smaller particles, and that way they don't spread it as much. Distance will help. And this thing is called the Swiss cheese model. It's designed, it's my favorite thing in the pandemic. Ian McKay is an Australian virologist who talked about how to protect yourself during a pandemic. With every layer of defense you see is like a piece of Swiss cheese. Not perfect, but it blocks some things. But if you layer the Swiss cheese, the holes feed on itself. So you have vaccines, a really good piece of cheese, still Swiss. People always think the vaccine is supposed to be American cheese. So there's no holes. It's not American cheese. It's Swiss cheese. There's holes. So, but it's a really good piece. Then you put a mask when you're at school, distance, ventilation, a team approach where more people are getting vaccinated is really important because vaccination is a team sport. And now you decrease the risk. And people did find in during the uh, last year's school year that schools were some of the safest places, even when community rates were high, because kids follow the rules and they don't mind wearing masks unless people make a big deal about them. Next slide. So final thoughts, and then I'll get into the questions because I know we're running a little bit long. Um, vaccination is a team sport. 
the more people that get vaccinated, the better. It's not just about protecting yourself. As we were saying, kids tend not to get sick. Why should I take a risk for my child who's not going to get that sick? Well, the idea is your child might not get sick, but if you protect him, that protects the world around him, which means the virus doesn't get to divide and we get through this quicker. The, the idea of trust comes into place when we're dealing with this. Why aren't people getting vaccinated? As we all know, this has been a very, very difficult time where people are completely they're angered by people who want masks, angered by people who, want, who don't want vaccines. Everybody's angry at each other. We really have to be better listeners when it comes to this. And when it comes to the real reason I find that people don't want the vaccine, the majority reason, let's say 70% of people are for lack of trust. It could be lack of trust in the product, lack of trust in the government, lack of trust in the medical system or the pharmacology system, lack of trust in wherever. But as I said in the very beginning of this, the people that you trust the most are the doctors, your doctor. If you're my patient, hopefully you trust me. And I like to tell everybody when it comes to vaccinating, I read all this stuff because I may like your kids, I love mine and I gave him the shot. Why would I do that? Why would I possibly risk my own children as a test unless I knew it was safe? And if I did that for my kids, how could I hold it back from yours? And that's where a lot of doctors struggle with this because it comes to be that matter of trust. And so we want to know what your spheres are because the more people we get back, if we have people in the community who aren't doing the vaccine, it's kind of like having a football team where half your offensive line decides not to block because they don't want to play this play. It's a running play and I prefer to block on passing plays or vice versa. If half your line doesn't block, you lose. The more people who participate together, you win. Um, on the bottom of this slide, as Ciara said, you're going to get the, um, these slides out there. There's a bunch of really good resources. This process has been unbelievably transparent. Many of the most important articles that have been put out in medical journals are free to everybody. If you go to the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the renowned journal of one of the best journals in the United States, you can see almost everything that's been done on coronavirus. Next slide. Um, in the end, I just want to say thank you uh, for my own family for dealing with my angst during this. I'm not usually the peppy person you see right now when it comes to this. I stress about it on a daily basis of how to talk to people and seeing the anger that's out there. It's really, really difficult. So I want to thank you to my wife, Darcy, crew, Bri and Corey, my kids. And um, thank you to my partners and everyone who's been dealing with this with me um, the other doctors in my practice and nurses and medical assistants and front desk staff at the pediatric group at 3030 Peds. And most importantly for everybody else, I like to say, keep thought alive. Do not just turn people off either way. Listen dispassionately and let's see if we can help get, get through this. I'm going to start taking a look at some of the, the chat questions, see if there's anything else I can answer. If not, I have other things I can say. Um, Let's see, da, 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 da. looks like I have one question. Should pregnant women who receive the Pfizer vaccine get the booster shot six or eight months after they got their last shot? Some European countries advise that the booster should be taken six months after the second. The US eight months is more commonly suggested. That is an issue that's um, right now being investigated. It does seem like immunity is beginning to wane at around six to eight months. And I do believe you're going to see people like myself, luckily, for most of the people who are asking this question, there are gonna be people leading the path because the people who got it first are the immunocompromised people and healthcare workers. I got my second shot January 20th. Six months, oh, done. Eight months is September. So when this rolls out in September, if they really find, the FDA looks at this and they say, you know what, we should get the booster, you'll see us starting to get the booster. Um, I think it makes sense. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people feeling terrible afterwards. Um, unfortunately, there is not a way at present to be able to 
find an easy test to measure antibodies. The immune system is a very layered issue. There's not just antibodies and white blood cells and T cells and B cells, they all interact. And to study that is very complicated. So right now, all we really have are antibody levels as a kind of guideline to do that. And we don't usually do antibody level numbers as a way of justifying one. So we have to let the science go through this. I do think there'll be some booster dosing mainly because of Delta. And I figure it's gonna be closer to eight months than anything else. Um, thoughts and advice on sending a two and four year old to pre-K with a newborn at home. Parents vaccinated, kids wear a mask, temp checked at school. Um, Morgan, it's a, a great question. And when it comes to questions like that, I tell parents is it's gonna depend on your risk aversion and how significant those risks are. You know, for certain children, if you told me that your four-year-old had speech issues and was learning disabled to a degree, I think that would lean towards sending them to school because a four-year-old could potentially wear a mask and help without. But if they can't, you know, that's a young group of kids and maybe you could do the teaching at home. It is very, very user dependent. I think you have to take all that information and the best thing to do would be to go in and speak with your pediatrician and kind of introduce them to the situation your family's going under. I can give you an example from my own house that my mother-in-law has significant issues. So we were extra careful, holding back even more than we normally do because we have to go and see, you know, take care of her and see her and make sure she feels safe. So we wanted to feel safe. And that's gonna be a discussion that you have with the members of your own house. But I'm sure your pediatrician or whoever can, you know, your doctor can help you make that decision. Um, Nicole March asked, when the vaccine is approved for under 12 of age, will it take in consideration the need for the booster? I don't think you have to worry about that because the booster will be many, many times down the road. My guess is that like the 12 year olds, who had a very big response, the younger kids probably have a big response too. One other bit of things that's important to recognize is the use of the word booster versus people who say like the flu shot. The flu shot's not a booster. You don't get a booster flu shot every year. You get a new flu shot every year. And that's the other problem here. There may be other vaccines that we need for coronavirus because we've waited so long there's gonna be other variants and the vaccine may not work. That won't be a booster vaccine. That'll be a new vaccine. Right now we are talking about boosters because a booster is the same vaccine as your antibody levels start to wane, you boost it by giving it a reminder. That's what a vaccine is, a reminder. So I think the kids under 12, because they tend to mount a very good response, we'll have to see where things stand at that age. Um, Liam asks, how, at the, uh, a lot of his kids have food allergies. Um, I understand, okay. So I don't think you have to wait to get, he's talking about food allergies and the fact that very early on in the course of vaccination, there were some anaphylactic events. I, what I tell every parent is when you go there, they have all the stuff at the ready, wherever they're giving it. I mean, I think I would in a case that you're talking about do it at a medical site, but I can tell you like at the Westchester County Center, there were paramedics and doctors and they had everything there. And if I was a parent with a child with allergies, I'd bring my own EpiPen too. Um, you know, that's a way of avoiding that situation. The anaphylactic numbers have really dropped. Um, during since the beginning of this. We really haven't been seeing the same number of cases. I know a lot of people with food allergies who got the vaccine and did fine. Um, Irene says, I believe it's still risky to send kids that are not vaccinated to school. They really should offer. So Irene, that's a really good point. But I can tell you if there's one thing pediatricians, educators, psychologists and psychiatrists weren't learned during this pandemic, virtual is not the way. Now, that's a generalization. Every child is different. And in a perfect world, you would have the perfect learning situation for every child. And I bet you there are some kids who virtually learn better. I can tell you a lot of kids struggled. I saw children with autism who melted away because how are they sitting in front of Zoom? People with ADD, with anxiety, with many things who they, 
this just not wasn't the way. And so I think if we learned anything in the past year, they've got to be in school as much as they can. And we try to uh, we try to minimize the risk as much as we possibly can. Um, that's the first dose, more like the second. Angela, the answer to your question about the second dose, yes. The second dose does give you more side effects. My 13 year old, as I told you, the second day after he got the, va the second vaccine came over to me and said, dad, aren't I supposed to be sick? He didn't feel anything. But as I told you during the talk, about 20% more fever is seen in kids, not higher, just more often. Uh, expect the same shot interval for five to two year olds. We'll have to see. Um, I think there's some debate about extending the time, but right now they're using all the same intervals with lower doses for the five to two year olds. Um, but we'll have to see what happens over the time when we get more information. Remember, this is all an active process. Um, okay, so uh, real quick, Angela's question is about a child who's small at 12. Um, he would get the same dose as an adult because that's what's been tested. It's not about size. Um, it's more about what's been tested for that age group. So um, I would not expect size to have an influence on the side effects at all. Um, the immunity, uh, the next question Amanda asks is a good one about uh, people who have newborns. Is a good amount of immunity from the vaccine passed to a newborn? If I have issues with breastfeeding, but I'm expecting a child in March, vaccine before I conceive, is there any protection if I don't breastfeed? There is some, as long as you still have antibodies, you pass antibodies into your child. That's why kids in the first six months of their lives tend not to get things like chicken pots, even when they're exposed, because they have maternal antibodies that go into their system and will protect them. So the fact that you're vaccinated, you will give some COVID protection antibodies to your newborn. Breastfeeding, interestingly enough, produces what's called IgA antibodies. Those are surface antibodies. Those are immediate protection. They don't, they're not long lasting. They kind of like coat the airway to protect. So the longer you breastfeed, the more they'll have that day to day to day protection. The protection they get from you usually lasts about four to six months. And then, and then, and then, um, okay. So that's, that's, I think, where we are with the questions. I'm going to close up with one little metaphor, and then I think we'll call it a night. And as I said, this, this is being recorded, um, so people can look it up. Um, I'm available at WestMed. People can find me. It's not hard. The analogy I've given people when it comes to deciding whether or not to vaccinate your kid and how do you get through all this information that's out there, because facts don't change this, is, again, I give this analogy of what I would do if I was to buy a car for my daughter or my son who are older, and I know nothing about cars. So if you're trying to buy a car for your teenager and you need the safest car, you cannot risk them ever getting hurt, but you don't know anything about cars. Sure, you go online and you read stuff, but you don't understand it. I don't know what a Fetzer valve is. I don't know, you know, anti-lock brakes from this, from that, what's the best thing. So what do you do? You go to your friend who knows everything about cars. We all have that friend. He or she works in a garage sometimes. They build their old cars. They modify them. They talk about cars all the time. We all know that person. And that person has a kid your age and says, this is the car I got my daughter. It is a brand new braking system. It's the newest thing out there. It's 94% better than anything, coincidentally, 94% better than anything that's out there. It's completely safe. This is what I would do for my child. Don't you buy that car? And why? Because you trust your friend's knowledge. I'm that guy. I read this stuff about the vaccines. I gave it to my own kid. I would never do anything to hurt my kids. I throw myself in front of a, the car I just bought just to stop it. Listen to your pediatricians. They're not doing this just to get something done. They're doing it because it's important and we can protect the community by working together as a team. Thank you all for your time. Um, again, my name is Dan Cohen. Please uh, look for me at uh, WestMed. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. And thank you for everybody who joined this evening.
As Dr. Cohen said, this is being recorded and the video will be posted up at westmedgroup.com. It will also be on the Westmed YouTube channel, so you can look it up at those two places. In addition, the slides that Dr. Cohen covered this evening will be emailed out tomorrow morning. Thank you everybody again for joining. Stay safe and have a good evening. Bye everybody.